The Intergalactic Council, a coalition of the galaxy's most powerful species, had grown accustomed to its dominance over the lesser worlds. For decades, they had watched humanity with a mix of curiosity and contempt, seeing Earth as a minor player on the galactic stage. Territorial disputes had flared up occasionally, with humans showing a stubbornness that irked the Council, but these had always been managed with minimal force. Now, however, the skirmishes had escalated. The humans had begun expanding their reach into sectors the Council deemed their own, probing boundaries, establishing colonies, and disrupting trade routes. The Council's patience had run thin. In a meeting of the Council's leaders, a decision was made. They would no longer tolerate these provocations. Confident in their overwhelming technological and numerical superiority, they concluded that it was time to force humanity into submission. They believed a quick show of force would remind Earth of its place and put an end to these territorial disputes once and for all. A plan was devised to surround a strategically vital human outpost, the key to human operations in the contested sectors. If this outpost fell, the Council believed, humanity would lose its nerve and capitulate. The human outpost, nestled on the edge of the disputed territories, was small but heavily fortified. It served as a crucial link in Earth's supply chain, a base for launching deeper incursions into the galaxy. Capturing it would cut off human reinforcements and logistics, leaving their expansion plans in ruins. The Council saw this as the perfect target. They dispatched a large fleet, a demonstration of power meant to overwhelm and intimidate. Their ships surrounded the outposts, forming an unbroken line of metal and firepower, dwarfing the human defenses. The Council's commanders, certain of their victory, initiated the next step of their plan. They broadcast a message to the human fleet, a demand for unconditional surrender. Their terms were clear and simple, immediate capitulation or face total annihilation. They cited the overwhelming number of ships, the advanced weaponry, and the countless soldiers at their disposal. They pointed to their history of quashing rebellions, enforcing their will with absolute authority. There could be no doubt about the outcome of a confrontation. For the Council, this was routine. They had seen it countless times before, alien species submitting when faced with their vast armadas. The Council believed that the humans would be no different. They expected a swift reply, a concession of defeat. The waiting began, with each minute passing like an eternity. The Council's leaders exchanged glances, some already discussing the logistics of the surrender, others talking quietly of their future plans for the captured territory. They were certain the humans would see reason. But the minutes dragged on, and there was no response. The silence from the human outpost grew heavier, unsettling. The Council's commanders repeated their demands, sending the message again, this time amplifying the threat. They detailed the consequences of defiance, speaking of the destruction that would rain down on the human base, the complete obliteration of any resistance. They waited again, fully expecting the humans to finally concede. Still, there was nothing. No message, no signal, not even a sign of acknowledgement. Just a void of silence. Confusion began to creep into the Council's ranks. This was not the reaction they had anticipated. They sent out scouts to gather more intelligence, to see if perhaps the humans were stalling for time, trying to negotiate in secret. But the outpost remained quiet, its defenses seemingly unchanged. The Council leaders were perplexed. They had expected a quick surrender, a simple acceptance of their terms. Instead, they were met with a cold, unyielding silence. They could not fathom what was happening. Did the humans not understand their position? Did they not grasp the futility of resistance against such overwhelming force? The silence began to feel less like hesitation and more like defiance. Doubts began to spread among the Council's officers, murmurs about why the humans hadn't replied, speculations about their intent. The Council's leaders, however, brushed these concerns aside, attributing the silence to human stubbornness or perhaps a delay in their communication systems. They remained confident that the humans would come to their senses soon enough. But as more time passed, that confidence began to waver. The silence stretched on, uninterrupted, and an uncomfortable realization started to settle in. The humans were not responding. They were not surrendering. The Council's demand hung in the void, unanswered, 
and for the first time, they felt the stirrings of uncertainty. What if the humans truly had no intention of giving in? What if they were not afraid? Inside the human outpost, the atmosphere crackled with tension as the council's demand for surrender echoed through the command center. The officers and soldiers paused for only a moment, absorbing the magnitude of the threat. Then, as if a silent agreement passed through them, they resumed their tasks with renewed focus. There was no discussion of surrender. The idea wasn't even entertained. They had known this day might come. They had trained for it, planned for it. Surrender was never a part of that plan. The outpost's commander, a seasoned veteran named Captain Reyes, stood at the center, his face set in a determined expression. He glanced around the room, meeting the eyes of his officers, all of whom shared his resolve. We knew they'd come for us, he said, voice steady. Now they're here, and they want us to fold. Let's show them how wrong they are. Reyes immediately began issuing orders. The outpost's defenses, already robust, were fortified further. Shields were raised to maximum capacity and additional power was diverted from non-essential systems to ensure they could withstand a sustained assault. Engineers worked feverishly, shoring up weak points in the armor plating and deploying automated turrets along the perimeter. The base's artillery systems were recalibrated for precision strikes, and mines were planted in key choke points. Soldiers took their positions, knowing full well they might not make it out alive. Inside the barracks, the mood was grim but resolute. Sergeant Daniels, a grizzled veteran with years of combat experience, gathered his squad. You heard the captain, he barked. No one's giving up today. They want to test our mettle. We'll show them what it means to be human. The soldiers nodded, their faces a mixture of fear and determination. They knew what was at stake. They had seen what the council had done to those who surrendered. There would be no negotiations, no capitulation. They would fight. Meanwhile, the tactical teams reviewed their options. They discussed every possible scenario, from repelling boarding parties to executing guerrilla tactics in the event of a ground invasion. Their plan was simple, hold the line and make the council bleed for every inch. They knew their enemy was technologically superior, but they also knew the terrain, their capabilities, and most importantly, their own limits. They had no illusions about the coming battle. It would be brutal and the odds were against them. But they were prepared to fight with everything they had. Reyes moved to the communications hub, gathering his senior officers. Prepare a broadcast, he ordered. Let Earth know what's coming. As his team scrambled to comply, he leaned in closer to the microphone, his voice low but firm. We're not surrendering, he said, as if to reaffirm the unspoken truth that had already settled among them. We're not even considering it. They may outnumber us, but they'll learn today that humanity doesn't back down. The preparations continued. Heavy artillery was brought to bear, strategically positioned to target the Council's fleet if they attempted a landing. Fighters were fueled and armed, ready to scramble at a moment's notice. The medical bay was prepared for casualties, and reserve troops were called up from every corner of the base. Supply lines were secured, and food, water, and ammunition were stockpiled to withstand a siege. Reyes and his officers pored over maps, analyzing every possible angle of attack, every conceivable scenario. They knew the council would likely try to overwhelm them with superior numbers and firepower, but they also knew that such tactics could be countered with cunning and tenacity. The outpost was transformed into a fortress, a place where every hallway, every room, and every doorway would become a battlefield if necessary. As the final preparations were completed, Reyes turned to his comms officer. Send the message to Earth, he commanded. Let them know we're ready. The officer nodded and keyed in the transmission. Reyes took a deep breath and spoke clearly. Prepare for a long fight. The message was brief, but it carried the weight of a promise, a vow to resist no matter the cost. The council's forces, irritated by the silence from the human outposts, decide to shift tactics. They begin with a series of displays meant to intimidate and demoralize, sending their largest ships close to the outposts, firing warning shots that light up the sky, and broadcasting their demands for surrender repeatedly. 
Their vessels, equipped with the most advanced weaponry in the galaxy, circle like predators, taunting the humans with their overwhelming might. The council then escalates to small skirmishes, probing the human defenses with swift, sharp strikes. A group of interceptors dart forward, their sleek forms cutting through space, aiming to test the humans' resolve. They fire warning volleys, expecting a panicked response, perhaps even a desperate surrender. But the humans hold steady, countering with precision fire from well-placed turrets and ground-based anti-aircraft guns. The interceptors retreat, surprised but undeterred, regrouping to plan the next move. Days pass, and the Council's attempts to break the human spirit intensify. They launch drones to harass the outposts, hoping to draw out hidden defenses and exhaust the humans' limited resources. But each time, the humans respond with calculated restraint, picking off the drones one by one, conserving their ammunition, and refusing to be drawn into wasteful engagements. The council commanders, expecting to see fear, instead find themselves facing an opponent that refuses to budge. The council's impatience grows. Weeks pass, and their progress remains minimal. What was supposed to be a quick demonstration of power has turned into a grinding standoff. The council deploys more ships, larger vessels with heavier firepower, intending to overwhelm the humans through sheer force. But the humans adapt, using their limited resources with unexpected ingenuity. They reroute power from non-essential systems to boost their shields at critical moments, deploy decoy ships to draw fire, and use electromagnetic pulses to disrupt the council's communications. Frustration mounts in the council's ranks. Every time they advance, they are met with resistance that seems far too coordinated for such a small outpost. They launch another skirmish, sending in a wave of fighters, hoping to break through the human defenses. But the humans counter with hit-and-run tactics, striking swiftly and then vanishing back into the safety of their base, using the terrain to their advantage. The council's commanders begin to realize that they are dealing with a foe who is far more resilient and resourceful than anticipated. A key encounter near the outpost's perimeter exemplifies this resilience. The Council sends a squad of their elite troopers to sabotage the human supply lines, believing this will finally weaken their defenses. But the humans, anticipating this move, set up a series of traps, explosive charges hidden under debris, electronic jammers that disable the troopers' advanced equipment, and ambush points where small teams of soldiers lie in wait. The elite troopers are caught off guard, their technology rendered useless in the face of human cunning. Forced to retreat, they leave behind damaged equipment and shaken confidence. As days stretch into weeks, a sense of unease spreads among the Council's commanders. They expected the humans to crumble, to surrender when faced with the might of their armada. Instead, they find themselves in a protracted standoff, their forces slowly drained by a thousand small cuts. Reports of failures accumulate. Fighters down by unexpected counterattacks, supply lines disrupted by guerrilla raids, and communication arrays jammed by unknown interference. The humans seem to know every move before it's made, countering with a precision that defies the Council's understanding. The Council's tactics are failing. Their commanders hold emergency meetings, debating new strategies, questioning how a single outpost could withstand their might for so long. Some suggest increasing the pressure with a full-scale assault, but others caution that such a move would come at a great cost. They are stuck in a situation they did not foresee, a battle that refuses to go according to plan. The Council, frustrated by the prolonged standoff, decides to abandon all restraint. A full-scale assault is ordered on the human outpost, a massive offensive intended to finally crush the resistance and end this conflict once and for all. The fleet moves into formation, ships aligning in a wall of metal and firepower, their weapons systems charged and ready. Waves of fighters are launched, accompanied by heavily armored carriers and warships designed to break through any defense. The council commanders watch from their flagships, convinced that this overwhelming show of force will shatter the human resolve. The assault begins with a relentless bombardment. The council ships open fire in unison unleashing a barrage of energy beams, missiles, and railgun rounds. The outpost's shields flare under the impact, trembling but holding. Inside the human base, there is no panic, only focused determination. 
The humans have anticipated this move. They knew it was only a matter of time before the council escalated. Reyes and his officers coordinate their defense, utilizing every trick and tactic they've prepared. They deploy decoy flares to misdirect incoming missiles and rotate power through shield sectors to withstand the sustained bombardment. Ground troops set traps and barricades around key entry points, turning the terrain itself into a weapon. Fighter squadrons launch from the outpost, engaging the enemy in a chaotic dance of fire and smoke, using hit-and-run tactics to keep the Council's forces off balance. The Council's forces, expecting a swift victory, find themselves bogged down in a grueling fight. The humans use the terrain to their advantage, drawing enemy units into narrow passes where they are ambushed from all sides. Mines detonate under the feet of advancing troops, and snipers pick off key targets with deadly accuracy. Guerrilla teams move like phantoms through the dust and debris, striking hard and fading away before the council can regroup. Amid the chaos, moments of raw bravery and sacrifice define the battle. A group of engineers, led by Lieutenant Harper, risks everything to repair a critical shield generator damaged by the bombardment. Under heavy fire, they work with determination, knowing the loss of that generator could mean the end for them all. They succeed, but at the cost of several lives, their actions buying precious time for the rest of the outpost. In another sector, a small squad led by Sergeant Daniels holds a choke point against an elite council assault team. Outnumbered and outgunned, they fight with everything they have, using improvised explosives and traps. Daniels, wounded but unyielding, refuses to retreat, rallying his squad with a defiant roar. Hold the line! They will not break us! His courage galvanizes his men, and they manage to repel the assault, inflicting heavy casualties on the enemy. The council's commanders watch in disbelief as their forces suffer losses they did not anticipate. Ships are downed by coordinated volleys from hidden turrets. Their best troops are stalled by human guerrilla tactics. Every inch of ground gained comes at a tremendous cost. Reports of casualties and equipment failures pour in, and the council's morale begins to falter. The commanders shout orders, trying to maintain control, but the longer the battle drags on, the more evident it becomes that they are fighting an enemy that does not tire, does not retreat, and shows no sign of giving in. Panic starts to seep into the ranks. Some ships falter in their advance, hesitating as they realize the human defenses are far more formidable than anticipated. The Council's assault begins to lose cohesion, their formations breaking apart under the relentless human resistance. The more they push, the harder the humans fight back, refusing to surrender, refusing even to consider it. The humans' defense is not just a battle, it is a statement, a declaration that they will not bow no matter the cost. The council commanders, who once saw this outpost as a minor obstacle, now find themselves facing the grim reality. Their forces are suffering heavy losses. Their troops are beginning to doubt their chances. For every ship that makes it through the human defenses, two more are destroyed or crippled. For every ground team that breaches the perimeter, another is lost to traps or counterattacks. And then, the realization dawns, a critical turning point in the battle. The council begins to understand that the humans are not refusing to surrender out of stubbornness or pride. They genuinely do not have a surrender protocol. The concept is foreign to them, irrelevant. This is not a fight they intend to win or lose by conventional means. It is a fight they will see through to the end, whatever that end may be. Faced with this stark truth, the council's commanders feel the weight of their miscalculation. They had assumed they could force a surrender, but they are up against an enemy that does not even acknowledge the option. The battle has changed. It is no longer a question of if they can win, but whether they can afford the price they must pay to do so. The council realizes, too late, that they are fighting a foe who does not fear defeat because they have already decided they will not accept it. The council, facing the grim reality of their faltering campaign, makes a final, desperate decision. This would be their last attempt to crush the human outpost and salvage their mission. They gather every remaining resource, calling in reinforcements from nearby sectors, mobilizing every ship, and preparing for a full-scale, all-or-nothing assault. The Council's leaders know that if this attack fails, they will have to retreat and concede a humiliating defeat. 
the final push begins with a renewed ferocity. The Council's ships advance in tight formation, focusing all their firepower on the human defenses. Massive cruisers lead the charge, flanked by waves of fighters and bombers. Their weapons light up the dark void, a continuous barrage aimed at overwhelming the outpost's shields and breaching its defenses once and for all. The commanders, watching from their flagships, are tense but hopeful. This is their last hope to break the humans. But the humans are ready. They have been anticipating this moment, knowing the council would make one final attempt to seize victory. As the enemy closes in, the outpost comes alive with activity. Every weapon is primed, every soldier prepared. Orders are given, and the humans launch a coordinated counterattack with an intensity the council has never seen. The human fleet surges forward, ships darting in and out of enemy formations with impossible speed and precision. They exploit every gap, every mistake, hitting hard and then disappearing before the council can retaliate. On the ground, the defenders unleash their full arsenal. Long-range artillery targets the council's cruisers, while fighters swarm their bombers, cutting them down before they can reach the outpost. Hidden missile silos open, sending volleys of projectiles into the midst of the enemy fleet. The council's forces begin to falter. Under the relentless human assault, their formations break apart. Ships collide, lose power, and spiral out of control. Squadrons, once tightly coordinated, are scattered, their lines disintegrating under the barrage of fire. The Council's commanders issue frantic orders to regroup, to press forward, but their voices are lost in the chaos. A climactic moment unfolds as the humans concentrate their fire on a massive Council warship, the flagship of their fleet. The ship's shields flicker and fail under the sustained attack. Missiles strike its hull, tearing through its armor, explosions rippling along its length. The bridge is engulfed in smoke, alarms blaring, as the Council's leaders finally grasp the full extent of their misjudgment. They are not facing a cornered enemy waiting to surrender. They are facing a force that has been biding its time, waiting to strike with every ounce of strength it has. One by one, the Council's ships begin to retreat. Some limp away, their engines damaged, others vanish into hyperspace, fleeing the battlefield. The once mighty armada, so confident of its superiority, is now a broken and desperate force. The Council's leaders, their faces etched with disbelief and humility, give the order for a full retreat. They know they have underestimated humanity's resilience, its will to fight, and its refusal to be subdued. As the Council's ships disappear into the void, the battlefield falls quiet. The human defenders, battered but unbroken, stand victorious. The outpost, though scarred by the battle, remains intact. The humans prepare for what may come next, knowing that this victory is only a chapter in a larger conflict that may yet unfold. They know the council will return, perhaps more cautious, more prepared, but they also know they have sent a clear message. Earth does not bow, and it does not surrender. In the aftermath, there is no celebration, only a somber acknowledgement of what has been won. The human commanders send out a transmission, a message to Earth and to any who might be listening across the stars. We are still here. And we are ready. Far away, in the council chambers, the leaders convene once more, their pride wounded, their forces diminished. They speak in hushed tones, their arrogance replaced by caution. 